other stuff. This is the, the system that I know best. If you're, uh, I, I see only one new face from the last session. <laughs> I'm David Klon and uh, I, I do Rivendell. Um, so I, I hope that this is a useful session. This is really a brief overview of Rivendell. I'll get into some more details on Monday afternoon with the advanced one. Um, and I'm happy to inter be interrupted uh, at any time with questions. And even if we want to take this uh, to a little bit of a diversion, lunch is after this. And I think this is a, an hour and a half session. Well, this was supposed to start at 10:45, so we're we're starting a little bit late. But uh, yeah, we could we have more time. I guess that's the bottom line. So I'm going to take you through uh, what Rivendell is. A little bit of repeat in this session. Um, I'm going to define radio automation in a little bit more detail than I did last session. So. Uh, Radio automation is a digital library manager at its core, right? Uh, and that includes such things as record label with, for, for metadata storage. It's a playlist manager, or in the, in the terminology of Rivendell, a log manager. Uh, old radio stations used to keep you used to keep a log of everything that went out over the air, and they were handwritten, and the, the person on the air had to, had to you know, keep it updated as their shift uh, progressed. And that terminology has transferred into the, some, of the, um, some of the automation systems, including Rivendell. Uh, so playlists and logs are synonymous. Um, a simple audio scheduler or content scheduler. Um, either fixed content where you just grab stuff out of your library and throw it into a playlist, or uh, um, rule-based where you set up rules for selecting stuff. So you apply the metadata to the, to the content, and then you set up rules for choosing the content from the library. Um, we'll, we'll get into some of that um, a little bit more. An automation system is an audio chain controller. So if you have a hardware-based switcher that, that switches from a satellite feed or from an internet feed or from a different studio or wherever, it, uh, your automation system should be able to control that switching system. Um, Rivendell has the ability to be a switching system itself. Um, Oh, and uh, the, the switching should either be based on time of day or based on some event taking place. We'll, we'll talk about that. A task scheduler, just generic tasks. Uh, downloading things from the intertubes. Uh, uploading stuff if you want to do, uh, if you want to build podcasts based on what you're putting out on the air, you can you should be able to do that with your automation system. And you can do that with Rivendell. If you want to, uh, if you want to schedule a task to check the condition of your library, you should be able to do that. And you can do that with Rivendell. Uh, and then, last but certainly not least, uh, some kind of report manager where you can define reports and have those reports get generated either on demand or um, on a scheduled basis using the task scheduler. So you can define your reports and then have them get generated so that you can um, just go and, and, and read them or do whatever you need to do with your reports whenever, you, whenever you're ready. So that's, those are some of the, the basic capabilities of radio automation. And then obviously, last but not least, is uh, you know, the content player, and something that has visual cues for the person on the air, something that, um, that can handle good transitions between events, and obviously that, that can, uh, it, it doesn't play a control element, but something 
that has the ability to control your automation system from the player itself. Well, how does Rivendell do this? Um, Rivendell is a suite of applications, and there are some desktop apps. Rivendell is um, not yet, but it's slowly transitioning to a web-based environment. Um, and right now, the primary method for interacting with Rivendell is via uh, either desktop or command line apps. And um, so this is sort of the list of the major apps. There are more. There are some utility functions and things like that. But these are the, the, the apps. And, and you either double click on an icon on a desktop or you type in uh, these app names that, that you want to run. RD Admin is for doing initial configuration and setup. Once it's set up, you don't run it very often. RD Library is the library manager. You'll use that on a day-to-day -day basis. The log manager is where you configure your events, your clocks, your grids, and I'll get into the, what those all are in a little bit. Um, RD Log Edit is a companion to log manager where you can, you can hand assemble playlists or logs. Um, you can change them after they've been generated. And then RD Airplay is the the player. It's, you know, it's the equivalent to Winamp, if you will. Um, there's a couple of command line applications. Uh, RD import is for importing external audio into your, into your library. Um, you can do that with RD library. There's a graphical a GUI interface for importing tracks. Either You can actually rip a CD right from Rivendell, right into your library. Um, but you can also import MP3s or Ogvorbis or FLAC files into your library. Uh, one of the key things to know about Rivendell is that it has its own library. Um, it, you can't just uh, point it at a folder of MP3s. Um, if you do that with Rivendell, it will suck those into its library. And it actually converts everything to WAV format. So, Rivendell's own internal format is WAVE, uncompressed, and obviously if you started with an MP3, it's going to transcode it to WAVE. Um, but if you, you know, if all of your content originally comes from CD, it will never get compressed at all. It's just pure, pure uh, 44.1 kilohertz uncompressed audio. Uh, the other bit of Rivendell is that it's got a tightly integrated database. And uh, Rivendell specifically uses the, the brand name MySQL for its database. And um, that database can be anywhere on your network. It doesn't have to be on the computer that's running all the Riv Rivendell apps. In fact, it frequently isn't. Um, and then uh, the other piece is audio chain control, where you have control of a switcher. Uh, this is a, a photo or an image of a broadcast tool's um, physical switcher. So it's got relays in it, and it, you can route audio through it. So uh, Rivendell knows how to control several brands of switching devices. So I'm going to walk through some of the graphical apps. And um, if you're a Rivendell user and you have other additional comments you want to make, feel free to jump in. Um, when you start, when you load up Rivendell, whether you go get an appliance CD or if you buy an appliance with Rivendell on it, uh, or if you install it from source code or whatever, you end up with an empty database with just a couple, couple of sample things in it. But by and large, it's an empty database. It's a blank slate. You get to do whatever you want with it. And that's often one of the most difficult aspects of Rivendell. It's like, okay, now I've got it installed. What the hell do I do with it? Um, you start by running RD admin, and you have the ability to do all of these things. Rivendell has its own notion of users. These are outside of the realm of login users. So when you uh, it, it's different than that. And by default, it comes with two of them. It comes with a username admin and a username user. Uh, and 
most Rivendell installations leave it at that. You don't have to really mess around with users too much. Um, whoops, going backwards. Uh, I'm going to walk through each of the, 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 these buttons. Uh, the user interface, Rivendell was designed to be used on a touch screen computer. And it, it, it was written back in the, the early 2000s when touch screens were sort of unusual, but um, they were mostly used by point of sale retail uh, establishments. And it's actually geared around uh, a touch screen that is um, 11, 7, 1160 by 86. I can't remember the specific format, but for example, when we get to RD Airplay, it fills an entire old-fashioned 4 by 3 aspect ratio screen. And that's the format that it likes best. And um, it expects that you're going to have operators that will walk up and touch buttons. You can use a mouse to click these buttons just fine. It works, it works just, just great. But um, it, it's optimized for a touch interface. And so you'll see on all of the, the graphical programs, uh, you'll see buttons more than you see, more than usual. Um, and so here you, you have only buttons in the administrative interface. So you start out by defining services. And a service is a, uh, a continuous stream of audio that's going to one place. And so, here, uh, as an example, I've got uh, the FM service selected and the HD2 service as an additional one. Um, so if, you, if you're streaming your radio, your FM signal, um, it would be counted as uh, you know, the same as FM. You split it off via audio cables, but it's considered the same service because you're basically simulcasting between the two. If you have uh, one or more separate streams from your FM broadcast, those would be defined here. So you have as many services. You can sort of think of it as uh, your station. Rivendell was designed to run an arbitrary number of stations from one location. So commercial broadcasters who have clusters of stations, um, it, uh, the closest big city to me is Madison, Wisconsin. And, uh, Midwest Family Broadcasting owns a dozen stations, and they run those out of the same physical location. And they could do that here, so they'd have each of those defined as a service. In general, you don't have very many. For, for a community radio broadcaster, you're not going to have very many services. Um, you have to be able to categorize the content in your library. And Rivendell does this by groups. And um, when, you, when you define your groups, it comes with a predefined set of groups. But I find that those aren't all that useful in general. And so one of the first things I do when I'm setting up a new Rivendell system is talk with the station that I'm working with, and we define a set of groups. You'll notice that you can color code the names, which color, Rivendell makes extensive use of color and it's really helpful to think through your colors. Think of, um, think of colors in terms of a map, you know, where you have every state is a different color, and not every, um, how do I say this? Uh, every state, you don't have more than maybe a half a dozen colors, but you use them um, to show differences between things and make it obvious what's different. So, Rivendell does that, and it's, it's important to think through your color scheme. Um, by default, it doesn't use any specific colors, but it lets you assign colors to things. So here's an example of, this is the name of the groups down this left-hand column here. And we have traffic, which is uh, what people call advertising or underwriting in red. We've got music uh, in dark blue here. We've got music beds, stings, macros, legal for legal IDs. Uh, so we've got a bunch of different groups. And when you have these groups, 
you, you put something into them, right? So you're going to put audio tracks into them. Um, the last session we talked about carts, and this time I actually have a picture of a cart. So for those of you who weren't around in the radio days of cart machines, you have this, this hunk of plastic with an endless loop of tape in it, and you slide it into this slot here, push the green button and it plays, and when it hears that inaudible tone on the machine, it'll stop it and cue it up. So those are carts. And that's what you're putting in these groups. Every cart gets assigned to one of these groups. Rivendell is a, um, a distributed application, and it runs on one or more computers. And in my example here, I've got it running on just one computer, but in every application I've ever seen, it runs on, you know, three, five, a dozen computers. You can have as many as you want. I, I don't think there's a, a, a physical limit imposed on the number of workstations that are, are participating in your Rivendell system, but, you know, more than more than a dozen, I think, would start to get a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing. Um, each host in your your Rivendell app application consists of, uh, or or has various attributes, and so you know it has an IP address. Um, you can monitor a host by clicking the enable heartbeat button, and so Rivendell is able to monitor itself and, is to, and to tell you when things aren't, when, it, when it's not behaving the way it, it, it thinks it should. Um, lots of different things up here. Um, and then down here you see this array of buttons. You can configure how each of these apps behaves on a per host basis. So you can assign audio channels when people are listening to music in the library app. Uh, you can assign that to a channel that, so that it won't go out over the air, for example. So it, you, you plug that into your audition channel. For RD Airplay, it has its own audition channel versus what's going out over the air. Uh, so all of these buttons allow you to configure those apps on a per host basis. So if you have, you know, six, seven, eight hosts, they can all be configured differently over here. Make sense? Rivendell honors the metadata that's in your tracks. Art, uh, it obviously knows about artist, song title, album title, um, the year the thing was released, the record label that pr produced or that published it. Um, lots of it actually has a whole bunch of. Uh, sort of odd and unique um, metadata things that it, can, that it can pay attention to. But it, it also has things that you can apply outside, over and above um, the default tags that come with the track, and those are called scheduler codes. And the reason uh, that they're called scheduler codes is that they're used by the rules that Rivendell has to choose music when building an automated, or when automatically building a playlist. So these scheduler codes, uh, again, this is a blank slate when you start out with Rivendell, and you have to come up with the scheduler codes. And my experience is that those will evolve over the first few months of using Rivendell, but after you have an understanding of how you want to use it, these will stay pretty constant. And so, uh, what I have here is a list of scheduler codes that uh, could be applied to a pretty diverse uh, set of rules. Uh, so I've got uh, categories of music here. Uh, A's are considered. So uh, commercial stations often um, will rotate different categories of music, and and so I've. I've just for purpose of illustration, I've got some of those kinds of codes here. We've also got um, calendar, so a community events calendar. Um, it's, there's often a little bit of confusion over 
whether something should be a group to which you assign a cart or whether it should be a scheduler code. A cart is assigned to a group. A scheduler code is assigned to a cart. So that's one way to keep the distinction separate in your mind. You put carts in a group, you assign codes to a cart. Um, a couple others. Here's underwriting for local news. Uh, we've got a special code for Democracy Now! underwriting so that I can, you can associate underwriting. If you have an underwriter that's specifically sponsoring a show, you can assign a scheduler code for that. That kind of thing. So scheduler codes are uh, ways to refine what you're choosing out of your library when, when time comes to, to uh, schedule music or whatever. So that's the, that's the highlight of uh, RD Admin. Um, you set it up, and in the first few months, you'll be using RD Admin pretty frequently. But after you get it working the way you like, you'll use that app less and less frequently. Um, RD Library, on the other hand, is something that you'll use on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, um, as you're moving stuff into your library, changing the, the groups around, reassigning carts to different groups, uh, or whatever. And again, it comes as a blank slate. Rivendell comes with no content other than a 30-second test. Uh, and that's just to make sure that the audio is being routed correctly. So this is what it looks like on a, a blank system. And after you get, uh, you know, after you start ripping CDs or uh, importing stuff from um, some external source, you'll end up with a huge list of stuff. And you know, you can click on these column headers to sort by different things. There's a search as you type field. So if you're looking for something. Uh, by Bob Weir, and you want to play something specific or, or find what's in the library by a specific artist, or uh, it, it'll search um, it, that field, that search as you type field, uh, will search artist name, album name, uh, track title, um, cart number, uh, scheduler codes. So you can search by just about anything you want. I mean, it's just like typing search into Google, and it refines the search as you type. Kind of handy for looking looking things up. You can also select uh, this button to display only a specific group. So if I'm only looking for local news, and I, I just want to display cards that are in my local news group, I can do that. Or if I only want to display uh, scheduler codes. Uh, related to um, the highest rotation, I can I can choose the, the scheduler code associated with that. Um, down along the bottom, we have buttons to take actions uh, and, and modify our library. You can add cards, and you can edit existing cards. You can delete cards. You can produce a report. You can rip a CD. So you've got action buttons down here, and this. This progress bar here uh, is more or less static, but it shows how much time in minutes is available in my library. Not disk size, but how many minutes of time are available. Uh, and it calculates that ba based on the total length of all the tracks in your library. So if you've got a lot of disk space, uh, I've got 15 hours and one minute of time available in my library, so I've got got plenty of uh, plenty of time that I can fill up with tracks. Questions about the library manager? When you click on a song and say edit or add, you get up a little edit window. And again, I apologize for how small this are this is, but uh, this is a track called "Take Me With You When You Go." And uh, you see that the, the average length is what this field says. Why is it showing me the average length? Well, every cart, remember that tape analogy where you could have a loop of tape with multiple tracks on it? You can do the same thing with Rivendell. Uh, this cart has one cut, but you can have, uh, I want to say, up to 255 
cuts in a card. So the average length says, well, of all those cuts in that card, this is the average length. And you can get the length of each individual cut here. Um, and the way cuts in a cart work is that every time you play the cart, it's going to play the next uh, least frequently played cut. So if, it's, if you're scheduling things um, equally, in other words, there's no weight. You can, you can actually assign a weight to a card. Whoops. You can assign a weight to a card so that it'll get played more frequently. But if all the cards have equal weight, it'll be a round robin. So it'll play the first one, and, after, and the next time this card comes up, it'll play the second cut. The next time the, the card comes up, it'll play the third cut. Yes? Can you schedule an actual percentage of the rotation? Or just, I guess, two to one? Could you do like 40%, 60%? Like, is that possible? Yes, that's what the weight does. All right. It's exactly. Yep. Yep. I have a question. So this particular thing that you have up right here, is that a song or is that a... In this, this case, it's a song. Yeah. Okay. So then what would be the purpose of scheduling the cards? Is that just for logging and, and knowing like how frequently it's being played? Uh, that's one use. Um, in general, your songs are going to be one cut per card. Um, one thing that I've done uh, at WDRT, uh, we have, do, do you all know what safe harbor is? Uh, safe harbor is the definition of a time during which you can play music that has uh, somewhat questionable content. So uh, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., that's called the safe harbor time. And that means that you can play artistic, uh, artistic pieces that have suitable, suitably uh, obscene or uh, un otherwise unplayable material and get away with it. So you can play music that has, you know, the word shit or some, some stations go so far as using the F word and they can play that during Safe Harbor. Um, you can assign day parts during which it's acceptable or unacceptable to play a cup. And so what we do is we put the Safe Harbor version of the song as a separate cut but it's only playable from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. But it's the same cart, so if that cart comes up during non-safe harbor hours, it will play the, the, the radio edit of the cut. So that's what I was asking, wouldn't that just be two separate files then? Well, so uh, why is it handling it that way is my question. This is just one way to do it. Okay. Uh, you don't have to do it this way, yeah. Uh, it's just one, one option. Um, yeah, there's, there's other ways to accomplish that, but this is one. This is the thing with Rivendell, I'll get to you in a second. There, there's always more than one way to do something, and you just got to choose one and, and be consistent about it. So, in that example, could you use a schedule code to find certain songs that Safe Harbor? Theoretically, yes, but it turns out that uh, if you let Rivendell do the scheduling, it will break those scheduler code rules pretty easily. So scheduler codes for Safe Harbor are, I've learned that it's not the best way to do it. But uh, in theory, you can. Um, so the cart takes precedence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and actually, group takes the highest precedence. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I'll get into some, some other aspects of the library manager in the advanced class. Um, one, of the, one, of the, the keys, one of the keys to a good sounding automation system is the transition between events. Um, and Rivendell gives you, the programmer, complete control over event transitions. And it's one of the, 
the features of Rivendell and, and those other top tier automation systems that set them apart from the middle tier, uh, give, giving you absolute control over the transition between events. And you, you do that uh, in the library manager. You assign characteristics. I'll get into that in the advanced class. So that's already library, maintaining your digital content. And it's, it's really important to have uh, either a person or a small team of people be your librarians for your digital content. Yeah. Uh, for those stations who have physical libraries of either vinyl or compact discs or maybe even tapes, uh, I, know, I know stations that have large collections of those and they assign a librarian to their library. It's no different with a digital library because it's real easy for your digital library to get screwed up and it's really labor intensive to clean it up once it gets screwed up. So um, regardless of what automation system you choose, uh, it's important to pay attention to your library and keep it as clean as you can. Rivendell gives you the tools to do that. Other um, other automation systems, you have to figure out how to manage that. How, yeah. how can it get screwed up? You like oh, yeah. Um, you, you could end up with, well, I'll give you an example. We, uh, we built our library at WDRT. Uh, before we went on the air, we had a CD ripping extravaganza. For about a month before we went on the air, we set up a workstation and we just had people bring in their CDs and we ripped them. We ended up with about 25,000 tracks and it didn't occur to anybody at the time to listen for um, unacceptable lyrics. And so our library isn't day parted and we didn't, uh, we didn't bleep out stuff that we didn't want to go out on the air. The end result is there are 16,000 tracks in our library right now that have never been played on the air over six years. They're useless, right? So there's nothing physically wrong with the library. It's just that it's got a whole bunch of crap in it that is, is completely ignored. So it's not that it's broken. Um, Rivendell does a really good job of maintaining the integrity of the, uh, uh, of the library, the database. But uh, from a human perspective, it's kind of useless, or at least 16,000 of those tracks are because nobody's using them. I mean, it's the definition of useless in my opinion. So, uh, you, you need to pay attention to and uh, maintain that library. Like it, I mean, it's your, it's your jewels of your station, if you're, especially if you're a music-oriented station. It's, 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 uh, it's the jewels of the station, yeah. Just because those 16,000 you can't use because you haven't confirmed they're okay. It, it's not that we can't use them, it's that nobody has ever played them. Because they, they haven't confirmed they don't have curse words in them? Yeah, nobody's, okay. nobody's screened them for... for um, yes, sir. I'm just saying. Yeah, just yeah. Saying. yeah the, the audio is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that... So what you should have done at the beginning when they were being ripped yeah. was... Yeah, we should have given better instructions to our rippers. We had, you know, we had a, a, a slew of volunteers that said, yeah, I'll share my CD library with you. And mm -hmm. it never occurred to to us to say, oh, shoot, we need to say, you know, go through these and, and mark the ones that have uh, in unacceptable words in them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what happened. And the other thing is, uh, more from a, a technical perspective, every CD has a different, um, let's say, median or average volume, right? Older CDs are much quieter than newer CDs. Rivendell has the ability to normalize yours so that all of your entire library is at a relatively consistent level, I mean, when it comes to music. Um, but again, we didn't pay attention to that when we ripped our library, and so people complain that some of the tracks in our library are way too quiet and others are way too loud, and 
one of the points of an automation system is to be able to walk away from it, right? And if you've got to have somebody sitting there riding the, the fader on the board, that sort of negates the purpose of the automation system. Are, are there legal and technical impediments to bringing in stuff from YouTube into Rivendell? Uh, in the case of YouTube specifically and iTunes specifically, there are. Um, whether those are traceable and enforceable is, is another issue. Uh, Ken Friedman is actually doing a session right now on licensing and, and things that are acceptable. But the short answer is, if you own the physical copy, like the CD or the vinyl or a cassette, and you bring it into your library, you have every right to play it. Now, uh, practically speaking, you're paying royalties as a radio station. Uh, for, for your FM signal, you're paying royalties to BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, and on the internet side, you're paying royalties to Sound Exchange. So if something gets played and it has a, a rights holder, it's not public domain, those people will get paid appropriately. Uh, so it, it, practically speaking, it doesn't really matter where the audio comes from. Um, but you know, lawyers would vehemently disagree with me. So I'm just giving you the experience that I have in working with other stations and working with my own station. I, I'm just saying because there are albums out there that you can't, yeah. you can't get, that yeah. you can't get, can't physically get, but can't get from right. YouTube. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so. Uh, but, but from a technical perspective, if you get stuff off the internet, you might want to pay attention. Every station has different standards for what they'll accept for audio quality. Um, our station, that standard is really low, and you hear some horrible sounding stuff on, on WDRT. I, I, I regret it, but I have no control over it. So, so technically speaking, you can you can bring stuff from YouTube sure. into yeah. okay. Yeah, if you have a way to convert that YouTube video into an audio file, okay, you can import it into Ribbon. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next app I want to talk about is RD Catch. RD Catch is the app inside Rivendell that is the, sketch, the job and task scheduler. Um, Rivendell runs on Linux, and Linux has its own task scheduler. Uh, in Linux, it's called Cron, which is sort of short for chronograph, timekeeping kind of stuff. Um, the granularity of, uh, of Cron in Linux is one minute. You can't get any finer finer grain than one minute. RD catch, the granularity is, I think, millis 10 milliseconds. Uh, might just be seconds, but uh, the point is it's much finer grain control, and you can start jobs and stop jobs with RD catch with that fine grain control much easier, um, or, or much, much more, you have much better control in Rivendell than you do in Linux. These are your options for scheduling jobs in RD Catch. You can schedule a recording to take place. And that recording might have nothing to do with what's going out over the air, or you might actually want to record what's going out over the air. Um, so depending on your audio card setup on the computer that's, that, that you're scheduling this job for, you can record audio. Let's say you have a satellite dish uh, and you have a satellite feed for, for some program. You can use um, Rivendell to record that satellite feed and store it in the library. Uh, you can use RD Catch to play audio content. So in theory, you could run RD Catch on what I would call a headless computer, one without a display and use RD Catch to run your entire radio station. And uh, nobody would have direct control over it. It would be entirely automated by RD Catch, the, the job scheduler. Um, 
that's kind of an extreme example, and I, I've never actually done that for a station, but you could do it, and stations do use RD Catch for playing the automation. Um, you can download from the internet, you can upload to the internet. So you could, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into these. Uh, you can run a macro card. Rivendell has its own programming language built into it, and those program elements are called macros. Does anybody use uh, Excel macros? It's, it's very similar to that. You've got these two-letter uh, commands, and uh, there's a slew of about 96 of them in Rivendell, and you can use those to, you can set them up to run at a specific time and have them take control or, or exercise control over your audio system. Um, a related uh, thing that you can do with RD Catch is to switch something. So you can schedule by time. Uh, let's say at the top of the 3 o'clock hour, we want to switch to our satellite feed live. You can use RD Catch to do that. Um, so those are the, the <coughs> six aspects that you can uh, control on a time basis with Rivendell. I'll show you, uh, the, the one highlighted in red is download. So for example, one of the common things, one of the common programs on community radio stations is Democracy Now! And this is an example of downloading and, and sucking into the library Demo Democracy Now! Go ahead. Yes, I have a question which maybe, maybe you've covered it, maybe I don't understand it, but we're intending to with a live announcer do a live show that will then be repeated at various times yep. in the week. Yep. And so this software can can record that half hour, you might say, yep. and then be able to replay it later. Yep. And, Absolutely. And if we wanted to, we could tweak it, uh, maybe take a little, uh, trim it up a little bit. Yeah, you could, you could either trim it up or you could add, um, when, when it comes time to play it, you know, you could add an announcement right yeah. before it that, that isn't like part of that audio file. It could be separate, you know. It, we're playing an encore presentation of a previously aired show. Yeah, an underwriting yeah. thing too. Sure, sure. Something like that could yep. be added. But, yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, this is not where you would um, download what, what are commonly called podcasts. Uh, so, in the previous session, um, Otis from Pacifica asked how many people were using the RSS capability of audio port. You wouldn't do that here. Uh, this is for uh, downloading things on a predictable schedule, a uh, scheduled basis where the, the files that you're downloading from the internet have predictable names. Um, and so in the case of Democracy Now!, you have a URL at democracynow.org, and every day the file name has the year, the month, and the day in it. And it's utterly consistent. So every day there's a new Democracy Now! MP3 file, and it shows up at, I forget what time it, that, that they promise it'll be there. I think it's, they promise that it'll be there by, uh, 9.30 Eastern Time. And so you can use RD Catch to download that file and automatically uh, import the MP3 into the library. And it will, Democracy Now is a good example of this, they include metadata in the file. And so uh, you can either choose to update the library metadata with what's in that file that you're downloading, or you can choose not to and, and ignore it. Uh, you can normalize it, the audio levels. Uh, you can schedule the days of the week at which it's going. And here, up in the upper right corner, you can schedule the time at which it downloads. So every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 9.45 a.m., we're going to download today's copy of Democracy Now! off of their website. Did you help? Oh, no. Um, so there's an example of a scheduled event that happens on a regular recurring basis. So look at a substring of that day, because 
Yeah. They change it every day. Like they change it. The yeah. end, you probably look for it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's why he has the, the variable names there. Oh. And that yeah. URL. Percent capital Y stands for the four digit year. Oh. Percent M is the month, two digits. And percent D is the two digit day. And if, if they required it, you could add a username and password. Uh, this will download um, HTTP, FTP, and maybe a couple other, I think it'll do a, a handful of other URL formats. So it handles some pretty good edge cases. So that's the job scheduler in Rivendell. RD Log Manager is now where we're sort of getting into the meat or the, the, the whole purpose of an automation system, and that is setting up automatically scheduled content on the station. And with Rivendell, this is a, a, a three-phased operation. The first thing you do is you make that slide stay put. You define your events. You assign events to clocks. And a clock is a one hour uh, period of time. And you take those one hour periods of time and you assign them to uh, one or more grids. And a grid is a one week period of time. So a grid contains 168 clocks. Um, and so it, Rivendell's model assumes that every week is essentially the same. If you have, um, well, at our station, we have some live shows that, uh, that are different from week to week. Um, if you have automated shows that are different from week to week, you have to deal with that by using multiple grids. Um, and Rivendell certainly supports that. But the, the, the common element here is a one week unit of time. So we have weeks comprised of hours and hours comprised of events. And those events can be as little as uh, zero time. In other words, a programming element that you put in an event takes no time at all, <coughs> but the content events take however long they take. I'll get into what all this means. Yeah. What if, what if your station is subject to a timeshare agreement for the weeks and then can you? Yeah, you, you would, uh, typically timeshares are like part say, of a day. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you would set up um, your part of the day using however many clocks it took to fill that part of the day. If it's literally 12 hours, you're, you're half and half with a, your timeshare partner. And you would create a grid that goes, you know, from the starting hour to the ending hour, and then you'd leave the rest of those grids empty. That's a great question. Thanks. So, first we have events, and again, Rivendell blank slate. You have to put every single event in there that you want to deal with, and this is a super simplistic view, but. Um, Jim, do you know how offhand how many events you have in your event no, database right now? It's dozens. Yeah, I mean this this is like uh, an event is play the top of the hour ID specifically at the top of the hour, or a different event might be play the top of the hour as close to the top of the hour as is convenient. So that, that's actually two separate events. Um, the one I have here is play it uh, at the top of the hour, but wait up to five minutes for the preceding thing to finish. And if it doesn't do it within five minutes, then interrupt whatever that was and play it anyway. It's not very uh, elegant because it doesn't know, by default, it doesn't know how to fade that preceding thing out. Um, but uh, that's the way, it, you know, you can have the flexibility to um, interrupt your own programming if you want. 
Um, this music event is basically choose any track out of the library. You can, you can apply uh, rules to it, and I'll show you how to do that. But uh, at its simplest, just grab something out of the library, pseudo-random. Um, play a promo, play an underwriting announcement. So we have four very simple events. Legal ID, music, promotional announcements, and, le uh, and underwriting. Yeah. So in terms of this example here, what's the main difference between using the RD volume and if you play certain things at a certain time, uh, and then also using the RD catch as a cron job for playing now? Oh, yeah, it's a good, a good question. What's the difference between RD log manager here scheduling all my stuff and RD catch to play stuff out at specific times? Uh, the answer is you would uh, ideally create the log, use RD log manager to create the log and then RD catch to actually fire it off. Yeah. So let's take a look at, it, at an event. Um, this I chart is all of the characteristics that I can assign to my event. In this case, this is this event is music. So uh, here we have a little mini view of everything that's in our library. And again, it's search as you type or display specific groups uh, or display audio only or programming element macros only um, but you can you can search for stuff here in general you're not you're not going to search well in the case of a music event we're not going to search for any specific music event here what we're going to do is tell Rivendell to import into the log from the music group so we've got select from highlighted and music chosen. So this event is going to select from the group music. It's going to select a card. Every time this event fires, it's going to select a card from the music group and plug it into a log. And this, uh, this aspect isn't happening in real time on the air. This is something that, you, that is going to take place some period of time before this playlist goes on the air. So this is a, uh, think of it as a batch job that's going to result after we finish setting up all these events. This isn't happening while Rivendell is on the air. This happens before the fact, and it's going to use these events to generate a playlist. So these are, this is where we start looking at the rules for selecting stuff in our library. We can assign up to two must-have scheduler codes. So you asked about uh, using a scheduler code for, the, for day party. You could do that here. It must have the scheduler code daytime only. Uh, and it must also have the, the code, um, I don't know, you could, you, could, you could get creative. But you're only allowed two, and it must have both of those. The thing to remember about this is that if, if other rules are uh, unsatisfactory, for example, title separation, uh, if I have uh, you know, four tracks that have the title uh, Stormy Monday, I want to make sure that I never play those any closer than, in this case, five tracks of each other. So when I'm running down the playlist, if I play Stormy Monday, I have to wait at least five tracks before I play Stormy Monday again, regardless of the artist. Uh, by default, Rivendell fills this in at 100, and you can tweak that per event. Um, you also tell about, you tell Rivendell for this event what the transition to this event should be. So in this case, uh, this cart, this uh, carts into this will segue. The, the three options for this transition drop down are segue, play, in other words, let the thing play out until the, the actual audio content is complete, or stop. 
So I can transition into this by, uh, I, I can actually stop the playlist from, from running. In general, you're going to have, you're going to use segue and play. And, and that, I'll, I'll get into the details of what segue, the difference between segue and play. For every event, I can also specify uh, an arbitrary number of specific cards that I want to play uh, before I import something from, in this case, music. And I can specify cards to play after. And those cards that play before and after could be programming elements. So, uh, I, I don't want to overwhelm you with, with all the options that are available here, but um, for every single event that goes into a clock, you can, you can have a lot of uh, very specific control over what gets chosen to put in a playlist. So, in, in our case, we have four events. And once I have all my events, I start plugging those into clocks. And a clock, you, you get this pie view grid. Uh, this represents one hour of time. And this is a, a sort of a list view of this. And again, we see the use of color. And this is, a, again, a very simplistic clock where we play a legal ID at the top of the hour, we play three music tracks, we insert a promo announcement, which is this blue line here is the same as this blue slice of the pie. We play a bunch more music, we play a promo, and then more music, then a promo, and then more music. So again, very simplistic hour, uh, but um, that's what it looks like. We also have a button down here called Scheduler Rules. And this is where four uh, tracks, uh, for all these tracks that are in this hour, we can set a specific set of rules. And we use our scheduler codes. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a view of that. I don't. Uh, I, can, I can bring it up in a bit. But um, for, for every scheduler code, you can set rules for things like uh, how close they can be played to each other, um, whether there can be another scheduler code of a different name scheduled back to back with these. So you can get pretty sophisticated with uh, how these, these music tracks play once Rivendell's going through the library and picking things. Um, the thing to remember is that scheduler code rules can be broken if your library is small enough. For example, the, the library I have on, uh, on my laptop only has about 700 tracks. And um, I ripped a bunch of albums. And so there's a whole bunch by, similar, uh, by the same artist. You know, an album is worth by the, by the same artist. And so I have not very many artists. So the artist separation rule is going to get broken a lot in my little sample um, demonstration database. David, what's yes, the sir? difference in um, uh, scheduler rules applied to the clock as opposed to applied to the event? What's the difference in how they act? Yeah, Jim's asking uh, how the list of scheduler rules here in the clock is different from these two rules that you choose here. Uh, this, so the Does event... Does one take precedence over the other, or...? Um, the, yeah, the, the scheduler rules in the clock take precedence over these must-have rules. Okay. Yeah, good question. Oh, really? Dang. <laughs> oh, holy cow, yeah. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but it's lunchtime. Um, so, I'll try to wrap up quickly. We've got our clocks, and then we assign the clocks to uh, grids. And a grid is pretty analogous with a service. 
In fact, it is exactly analogous with a service. So if I've got an FM service, I've got an FM grid. And the grid is ex exactly this. Go ahead and count them. There's 168 uh, blocks in this grid. Each of those blocks is one hour of time. So I assign hours to the week. And every one of those could be different, or as you see in this example, every hour is the same. This is a really boring radio station. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to it. Um, and then after you set up your grids, you generate log. And the generate log is this little screen here where you select your service, you give it a date, and you click the create new log button and it goes off and it says, okay, I'm going to create 24 hours worth of, uh, worth of playlist. Um, if you're time sharing and you only have, you know, if you cut it off, you know, we're 50-50, we go midnight till noon and they go noon till midnight. Uh, when you generate your logs, you're going to just generate as much as you have clocks scheduled in your grid and it'll just leave gaps for the rest of it. Um, and this is the last thing. This is the player interface. So if you have a computer in your studio hooked up to a fader on the board, this is the interface that your announcers are, are going to see. So for example, at our station we have a mix of live hours where somebody's in there spinning records or playing stuff by pushing buttons on, uh, on Rivendell, but we also have hours that are completely automated. And so this is uh, the view of the log. So you've got a scroll bar here. So you've got basically 24 hours worth of content here. And this is the, the sort of zoomed in view. So everything that's in light green or dark green here is transferable over to here. And you get a zoomed in detailed view. Always what's on top is what's currently playing. It's, you notice it's got the red start button and these, you could start any of these manually by touching the start button and uh, interrupt or change, you know, change the flow of stuff. But you've got view meters, you've got a clock, several clock views that show uh, the status of the clock. You've got three modes, automatic, live assist, or manual. Um, and then you've got you know, th ways to change what's, what's displayed here. Uh, but this is, this is the player interface, um, and it's meant to be in a studio. And that's the Whirlwind Tour. And uh, I appreciate your questions and your patience. Thank you. Um, Monday is the advanced one where we'll get into uh, voice tracking, uh, more details about scheduler rules,